If you have watched the past few episodes of History Traveler, you know that we are in the middle of an epic summer road trip on Route 66, traveling the entire length from Chicago to Santa Monica, California. And currently, we are in St. Clair, Missouri. Came through St. Louis yesterday, and last night stayed right here at a place called the Pine Mark Inn, which last year made Yelp's top 20 hotel establishments. And, and after having stayed here for an evening, I can see why. Like, the, not only was the room great, but just the, the hospitality was really second to none. Something that I really haven't experienced before. And uh, if you're traveling along Route 66, this is definitely a place that you want to stay. And it's also a place where a lot of people from around the world have stayed. And they have a little bulletin board inside that I want to show you. Okay, we are in the dining area of the hotel now, and we're, we're just gonna be real quick, but I wanted to show this because I thought it was really neat. I had somebody showing me this earlier. Uh, so here at the hotel, well, like the owners and staff want to be part of your travel experience, and they have this giant world map on the wall, and if you move a little bit closer, well, you can see these little, like, drop pin stickers here showing where they've had visitors from all over the world. Okay, so I'm seeing the UK, uh, Finland, Norway. There's the Faroe Islands. That's crazy that they had visitors from there. Here you can see all places from Central and Southern Europe. And uh, if we move over here, yeah, also somebody from Tokyo. And then here they have these, these Polaroids of some of the international visitors that have been here. So for example, we've got Belgium, we've got Germany, Italy, and Romania. Man, that is really something. So uh, well, Route 66 is something that is special, not only to people of the United States, but people around the world. All right, so I uh, have something pretty cool and unexpected. Uh, here in this town, there's something called the Route 66 Car Club or in this area. And uh, today they happen to be having a car show as we are passing through. Uh, there's something that is kind of uniquely American about car culture. Uh, I just got back from a trip from Europe and uh, there's a, a saying that for Americans, 100 years is a long time and for Europeans, 100 miles is a long distance. I was talking to a buddy who lives in Britain. He was talking about a place three hours away and he's like, oh, it's so far away. Well, that's like an afternoon drive for us. So anyway, this kind of uh, reflects the, the history and culture around Route 66. So we're gonna take a quick look around. We don't have a lot of time. Uh, we're gonna take a quick look around at some of the cars here and uh, maybe talk to a, a few of the people and then get back on the road. So I'm going to go ahead and confess off the get-go that I'm not much of a car guy. Uh, I, I don't know as much as other people. Uh, but here's what I do know. I like old stuff. When it comes to, you know, the choice between new stuff and old stuff, I always prefer the old stuff. And that goes with vehicles, too. Like, the, the old stuff just seems to have more character to me. Uh, a lot of newer cars kind of all look the same. So here's an old uh, 41 Ford commercial pickup truck. Uh, we get over here. And we have uh, something that definitely has a lot of character. This is an old uh, Chevy Coupe, 1940. Uh, here's an old Ford Roadster, Roadster uh, 1932. Uh, so yeah, they're just all kinds of interesting things. And all these people, you know, are passionate about cars and they are passionate about history. And then come out and share that history. Okay, well, I'm Steve Cook. I'm vice president of the Route 66 Car Club. 
Our club started in 1989-1990, uh, right around that time period, uh, right here in St. Clair, Missouri, which is a Route 66 town through Missouri. Um, a lot of the guys that started the club originally worked for the Chrysler plant, which was in Fenton, uh, Missouri, and it's since gone. Chrysler's no longer in St. Louis. Some of them worked at the uh, Ford plant up in Hazelwood. But uh, the guys that started the club, they were all American-made uh, car enthusiasts. And uh, we're all involved with the Route 66. Uh, Missouri has a tour every year with the Route 66 Association. And a lot of the members of our car club are members of the Route 66 Association as well. What, what do you think it is about Route 66 that attracts car enthusiasts? I think it's because of the nostalgia of all of it. You know, you sort of, when you're on the old Route 66, uh, take the old roads. Uh, a lot of it's the old brownstone road. You're off the beaten path. You get to see a lot of the old, uh, you know, attractions along the wayside that a lot of them now are broken down and and uh, turn into dust. But it's nostalgic seeing the old uh, the old attractions along the road and taking your old car driving along the road. It sort of takes you back into a time in history that was more enjoyable than the current day. You know, back before cell phones. All right, so I guess they had a contest here today, and they have some of the top cars from the contest lined up here. So here's an old 67 Chevy Camaro uh, that got number five. Uh, here's an old Corvair that got the number four place. Look at this old Chevy truck. Like, I just, I love the look of that. Uh, this is a, a 49 Chevy. Uh, number two was a 19... 70 Mercury and then if we go over here looks like oh wait okay this is number 10 which is a uh, Ford 1978 camper special f-250 which looks pretty dang cool and I have no idea where the number one car is so anyway yeah really neat seeing all of these vehicles lined up here together All right, well that was kind of a cool, unexpected stop. Uh, lots of interesting cars, lots of good people, uh, all out here having fun in the hot summer heat. Uh, so anyway, we're going to get back in our vehicle, which honestly, after walking amongst all these vehicles, feels pretty lame now. And uh, anyway, we're gonna get on down the road. We have made our way just down the road a little bit to the town of Stanton, Missouri. And as you are traveling down Route 66, one thing that you will notice all along the, the route, especially in the Midwest, are barn roofs that are painted with advertising for a place called Merrimack Caverns. Well, right now, I am at Merrimack Caverns. As a matter of fact, this is the Merrimack River, which Merrimack Caverns is named after. And all of that, that advertising that you see along the route is the, the product of a marketing genius and business entrepreneur from the 1930s and 40s by the name of Lester Dill. Uh, he, he was the one who bought the property that the cave is on and ended up kind of developing it uh, into what it is today. But uh, it's not just any cave. This is actually a cave that has a lot of history with it. As I mentioned, we are standing on the banks of the Merrimack River. And in the 1700s, this area would have been occupied by the Osage Indian tribe. And in 1720, there was a French explorer by the name of Philip uh, Renault or, or Renault. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming it's pronounced Renault. But anyway, he made his way up this river in a small boat with a few men and an Osage Indian guide. And the Osage had told him about this gigantic hole in the earth where the Osage would take refuge during extreme weather. Well, they got up to this point and the gigantic hole in the earth was right here at the base of this bluff ahead of us. Uh, what they ended up finding was what would be the, the largest cave west of the Mississippi River. Uh, now, they had, the Osage had told 
uh, Renault about this um, oh like glittering veins of some kind of a yellow metal uh, that was inside of the cable of course that got their attention uh, they thought that it was gold uh, what it ended up being though was something called saltpeter which we'll talk about in a second uh, so anyway we're gonna go inside the cave uh, it's 60 degrees in there today we got a heat advisory so it's actually a, a good day to be visiting Merrimack Caverns all right, uh, we just got into the cave. We're going to take a tour here in a little bit. Uh, but first, I want to explore a little bit of the, the history attached to this cave. In the museum portion of the cave, they start off by talking about the original people who were here in this area and who would have been familiar with this cave, uh, the, the Osage Indians. And as I mentioned, it was the Osage who guided the French in this area and made them aware of this cave to begin with. So here you can see some different depictions of French explorers going down the river and encountering the Osage in this area. Uh, here you can see on this map of Missouri the different uh, Osage Indian trails that were, were used, kind of like the, I guess you could almost say the highways of the time. And then here is a map showing Renault's route. So he starts off in St. Genevieve, right off the Mississippi River, goes over land, hits what is now known as Big River, and then hits the Merrimack River, and goes up to what we now know as Merrimack Caverns, but then was called Saltpeter Cave. So there was no gold here in this cave, but there was saltpeter, which was used in the manufacture of explosives. So there was a lot of mining that took place here, uh, not of gold, but of saltpeter uh, for use in gunpowder. Here on this display they talk about the, the next phase here at Merrimack Caverns, which would be the settlement phase. So there were a few men. Uh, the first was a guy by the name of Stephen Sullivan, who was born in 1795. He actually encountered Daniel Boone in St. Genevieve, and Boone advised him to, to move to this area, so he and his wife uh, settled here. Uh, they eventually linked up with uh, another settler by the name of Peter Stanton, and they were kind of doing a joint venture of uh, farming and mining in this area. Well, at the mouth of Saltpeter Cave, well, Peter Stanton is believed to have established a munitions plant uh, using some equipment that had been abandoned here. And uh, that went all the way to the Civil War. Well, of course, when the Civil War flares up, a lot of tensions flare up, and uh, the Union forces, which were stronger in this area, even though Missouri was a slave state, uh, ended up taking over the operations here in Saltpeter Cave. Uh, and then in 1864, well, this guy right here, Sterling Price, launched a raid into Missouri. Uh, they are believed to have taken over this area and shut down the operations. And it's thought that with Price on that raid was Quantrill's Raiders, which included Frank and Jesse James, uh, two men who would believe to be you know, returning here later on, uh, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. Uh, but if you look here, they have a few artifacts. So here you see this old rusted Colt revolver. Uh, this was actually found back in the cave by Lester Dill at a place called Loot Rock that we'll take a little look at later. Uh, and then they also have uh, this cool little bullet mold. Now while we're talking about the Civil War, take a look at this. This is really, really interesting. Uh, this is an iron boat from the 1860s. Uh, this was found under a bunch of mud uh, along the Merrimack River, not far from the caverns. Uh, it says here that it weighs 400 pounds. Uh, it had a top speed of 1.5 miles an hour. Uh, it was powered by a little small steam engine and a three inch propeller. Uh, so it's possible that this boat was used to transport gunpowder uh, from the caverns uh, down to Union troops. That is really interesting. After the Civil War, the cave is going to go through another transition. Rather than being a place that is focused on mining, uh, the 
focus is going to shift to entertainment. So you would have people from St. Louis who would come out here and have gatherings in this big cave. So here you can see this advertisement for a cave picnic at Saltpeter Cave, Saturday, May 18th, 1895. Uh, so that's really interesting. Uh, now, Route 66 is going to open up in 1926. And in 1933, well, the cave is going to make a transition to what we know it as today when Lester Dill purchases this property and, and really begins to transform it and, and make it the attraction that it is today. And uh, we actually have the grandson of Lester Dill here with us today uh, to give us a little bit more insight into this era of the history of the cave. parents originally came down here in 1933 and they actually lived in a tent right out there on the Merrimack River and my grandfather would take people through the cave with a coil lantern and my grandmother and my mother would keep people entertained on the outside till grandpa would come back out take another bunch through and I believe at the time they charged 17 cents to go through the cave that was 1933. My father uh, was actually given credit for developing the bumper sign. Uh, 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 they used to tie bumper signs on. We have an example back here on the wall. And when I started as a boy in the 50s, in 1956, I was 10 years old. And we originally tied the bumper signs on. And then later, we stuck them on. And my grandfather and another man that was the manager here, Lyman Riley, they actually got credit for developing the first stick-on bumper sign. And uh, that was primarily the advertising. And then my grandfather, uh, he was a carpenter by trade. In the wintertime, they would close down the cave because there wasn't enough business to take people through. And they, they would go to Florida during the big boom down there, the building boom, he and his brothers, and they were in construction work. And my grandfather noticed these barn signs with mail pouch tobacco and drink Coca-Cola, stuff like that. So he told my grandmother, he said, I wonder if that would work for the cave. And she says, well, why don't you try a couple? So when he got back, he knew every farmer in the country because that's what his father was. And they knew all the other farmers. And he went around, talked to the ones that was close to the cave. And he offered them a deal. They couldn't refuse. He, he'd give the man a railroad pocket watch He'd give the lady a box of chocolates and he would promise to take care of their uh, barn as long as Merrimack Caverns, he could paint Merrimack Caverns on it. And if a piece of tin blew off, he'd send the man out, put it back on and repaint the barn when it needed it, what have you. And it was a good deal for the farmer, it was a good deal for him. And every time he added a barn, more people come to the cave. And so at one time we had over 200 barn signs and 100 billboards. And of course, the laws changed and the Beautification Acts with Lady Bird Johnson, uh, they did away with a lot of that. Now we're not allowed to paint the barns anymore. So as they deteriorate or fall down, that's just the end of them. But we have some of the very last barn signs that are out there. Here in the caverns, they have some pictures that, that kind of trace through the history of the caverns. Uh, after Lester Dill purchased the property. Uh, the photo that we are looking at right now is from the early 1930s. And here you can see this crowd gathered in front of the cave. Uh, here is the first concession stand that was put in front of the cave that sold refreshments. Uh, here I can see a little sign right there in the corner that says, it's cut off, but it says Old Gold. It's for Old Gold cigarettes. And then right here, well, you notice on the left, there's a sign that points you to the toilet. And uh, Lester was telling me that that sign actually just pointed you to some trees <laughs> behind the shed. And that's where you would go to the bathroom. Uh, and then here are, uh, or here is a picture from the 1940s. Uh, right here is Lester Dill and his wife, Mary, and some other family members. And uh, he talked about how Lester was the man who invented 
the, the bumper sticker or the bumper sign. Well, here is one of the original bumper signs that the kids would tie on to the back of the cars to advertise for Merrimack Caverns. There you can see it says US 66. And uh, they were having some problems keeping the signs on the bumpers. He noticed at the top of the hill that they were all falling off. So he punched holes in the signs and then tied them on to, uh, to ensure that they stayed on the car. So uh, people left with a little souvenir from Merrimack Caverns and Lester Dill had a little bit of advertising for his business. Here are some more photos going through the, the history of Merrimack Caverns. I love these old photos. These are from the 1950s. Uh, and here you can see where there was an expansion into what, what I guess would be the very first visitor center. And there was a, a restaurant down below, but there was problems with flooding of the Merrimack River. So that ended up being filled with gravel. That is actually beneath us today. Uh, and then here you can see where people used to be able to drive into the cave, which is pretty interesting. And as they drove out, of course, it's 60 degrees year round in the cave. Uh, Lester would tell them to roll up their windows and for 15 minutes they would have cool air inside of their car. Of course, this was before air conditioning. And then right here is a, a view of the original building from across the river. Uh, this is so neat. All right, so that's a, a little bit on the history of Merrimack Caverns. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and jump on a private tour of the cave now and uh, see, see what there is to, to learn back in the cavern itself. Now, when you first go on your tour into the cave, this is the first room that you come into and it's the, the largest room. This is called the Grand Ballroom. Uh, now, during the, around the turn of the, the century, oh, locals used to come here and they would have square dances and they would have parties and uh, they continued that all throughout the 1900s uh, and they still have events here today. So yeah, pretty cool. All right, we've moved into the next room of the cave here and this room is called the gunpowder room. So I talked earlier about how this was originally called saltpeter cave and there was saltpeter in here that they would use to make gunpowder. Well, this is the, the room where a lot of that took place uh, until operations ceased um, uh, you know, midway through the, the Civil War. All right, now we've moved into a place called the division room. And in 1939, uh, Lester Dill discovered an opening right up here that went even further back in the cave, got up there, noticed some cool air that was blowing in, and then kind of opened the passage up a little bit more and found that this cave was a lot bigger than anyone had ever known. And during that time, there was, I guess you could call it an underground lake, that the water line went right up to this spot right here. Well, in 1941, uh, there was a major drought here in Missouri, and it caused this underground lake level to actually drop. And uh, during that time, a couple of tour guides noticed some cool air coming out of another passage that is just up ahead of us here. Uh, they went and got Lester Dill, and of course, uh, the same scenario, noticed some cool air coming out of this, this new passage, uh, went down in it, and uh, again found this cave to be much larger than any of them ever knew. All right, so we've just moved into the next room. Now, this is the room that Lester Dill and the tour guides would have discovered uh, in 1941. Uh, now they call it Loot Rock, uh, this room right here, uh, because they found something here that was possibly connected to Jesse James and the, the James gang. And I, I got my buddy Carter with me, show me around today, uh, who's gonna tell us a little bit more about this story. So this is our Loot Rock area back here. So in 1941, when those two tour guides first discovered this area, they found 26 items right here on top of this rock. 
Those items were related to a train robbery that happened somewhere around the 1870s. Now, how do we know that? Well, this chest right here. This chest used to carry 1,200 gold coins, back then worth about $12,000, and in today's money worth around a quarter of a million, also weighing about 76 pounds of gold. Very impressive. That is the real chest along with two garden barrels and that lantern out of those 26 items found. And on the back of this chest had the Denver, Missouri Mining Company seal, which was proof that that was on a train eyewitnessly robbed in front of the sheriff by the Suborther gang. The second clue is that sheriff report in which he says that he tried to stop these two gentlemen and failed. So eventually he gathered his deputies together to track him down this cave where they sure enough hanged outside for about three days and three nights trying to starve these two boys out of here. Of course they failed and eventually came in here guns blazing only to find these two young men gone along with that sweet treasure. Where they escaped to? Well, they escaped through our beautiful underground river system right down that way. All right, continuing our walk through the cave here. Uh, now, in this cave, we also have a, a little bit of Hollywood history. So, if you look here in the distance, you see a photo of a dog. Uh, well, that should be one of the most recognizable dogs in the world, that is Lassie. In the 1960s, there was an episode of Lassie that was filmed here at Merrimack Caverns. Uh, side note, if you look at this little passage right here, uh, that goes back another seven miles. So we are only scratching the, the surface of this cave. And then if we go back over in this direction, well, there was a movie that was made back in the, I think the 1960s, uh, about Tom Sawyer. And there is a scene in the movie where uh, Tom Sawyer and Becky Thatcher are running away from a character uh, who is known as Injun Joe. And right here in this spot, well, they kind of run up this cliff and then uh, Joe falls off of the cliff and he like falls down hundreds of feet. As you can see, it's probably about 15. Uh, but anyway, that scene was filmed uh, right here in the caverns. So yeah, a little bit of Hollywood history here too. As you're making your way through the cave, uh, sometimes when you look up, you'll see these formations coming from the ceiling that are known as soda straws. Well, soda straws eventually will form into what are called stalactites. Uh, so here in really this beautiful room in the cave, you can see some good examples of these stalactites. Uh, of course, as the water drips down with the limestone, uh, they will form what are called stalagmites. And then eventually, as the two continue to form, well, they will grow together into these columns. So this is really, really an impressive room here in the cave. And I can only imagine what Lester Dill and some of those other guys that were exploring this must have thought when they were the first ones to uh, come up and, and see this for the first time. And then over here, well, this is a formation that here at the cave they call Onyx Mountain. Uh, this is a continuing uh, formation that is, as you can see, has water dripping down on it and continues to grow. And there are all kinds of different minerals that are uh, leaching down and continuing to build this formation. Okay, moving up now to another area that is called the wine room. And there are 58 steps, Woo trying not to fall, uh, 58 steps to get up to the top. And there are some reasons why it's called the wine room. Uh, one of the reasons might be because people whine uh, when they have to go up these 58 steps. Okay, we made it up to the top of the steps and holy smokes, look at this place. So as I mentioned, this right here is called the wine room and there is a reason why they call it the wine room if you look there are some very unique formations here uh, these are called botryoids and 
as you can see, they look like uh, grape clusters. Uh, another reason why this room is called uh, the wine room in addition to these botryoids is this thing right here. Uh, this is the what they call the, the wine table. Um, so this is one of two wine tables known to exist in the world. The other one, ironically, is in Italy. Uh, but again, very unique formation in this cave. So yeah, getting a, a little bit of history and a little bit of geology in this video. All right, well, uh, that place was really cool, both literally and figuratively. And there was a whole bunch that I didn't show in there as well. Uh, they have like this cool patriotic light show at the end on a thing called the curtain that, that was really, really neat. Uh, and there's so much more here. They, they have riverboat tours, they have a zip line, whole bunch of things for the family. So anyway, uh, definitely a classic stop here along Route 66. All right, uh, we're gonna jump back in the vehicle and uh, head on down to our next place. rolling through the town of Bourbon, Missouri now. And when you come through Bourbon, one of the landmarks along Route 66 is their water tower. Uh, I guess the, the joke is that when people turn on their faucets, you have to wonder what is coming out. But anyway, another uh, pretty famous landmark here along Route 66. All right, well, I uh, have piddled around a little bit too much today uh, doing a, a few little side trips. Uh, and I am now in Cuba, Missouri. Uh, and that's okay, because Cuba is the home to the longest continuously running motel on Route 66, the Wagon Wheel Motel. This is a motel that started in the 1930s. Uh, I think we're actually gonna stay here tonight uh, we'll, we'll get back here in, in just a little bit, but I want to go into town because there's some murals, a museum, and, and some other things that I want to check out. One thing that I've really enjoyed as I've been traveling through some of these small towns along Route 66 are how some of them have taken to putting murals on their buildings and uh, kind of putting their own personal brand uh, for their place on Route 66. So here you can see uh, one of the murals for Cuba. Uh, where they've kind of designated themselves as a mural city. And there's a, a mural that caught my eye right over here that I thought was pretty interesting. Uh, it looks like some figures at a county fair. And uh, no, also noticed that there was a little historic sign uh, right here at a place called the Wallace House. Well, right here in 1940, there was a man who was running for Senate in Missouri on the Democratic ticket by the name of Harry S. Truman. And uh, the sign says that he was campaigning here. And there were two Democratic committee men who were his only listeners as he was speaking on the steps. Notice that people were kind of hurrying by on the street. Well, it turns out they were all going to the county fair. So Harry Truman ended up picking up the Coca-Cola box that he was standing on and just made his way to the fair as well. Uh, little did all of those people know that the man Boy, that is a loud vehicle. That is obnoxiously loud. But anyway, uh, little did they know that the man who was speaking on the steps of the Wallace House would be president five years later. And this mural kind of depicts that scene and also the county fair. And then in real kind of faded paint over here, well, you can see it says, Vote Truman for U.S. Senator. That's really neat. 
here's a mural in town that has really caught my eye. And as you can see, uh, we're looking at some men in uniform in a train car. Uh, the town of Cuba is right on the railroad. As a matter of fact, if you look down at the end of the street there, uh, well, you can see where the railroad is. And there was a train company called the, the Frisco Company that ran through here and they had a train called the the blue bonnet that was named after the texas state flower it had it was pretty distinctive uh it was colored blue and white and during world war ii well there were a lot of guys from this town who got onto the blue bonnet to make their way to basic training and some of those guys never came home so this wall which I think is just really, really neat, commemorates six men from this town who went off to war and never came back. Uh, like Ralph Fishwick, who was in the Navy, uh, was killed in Africa. Uh, Preston Gibson was killed in Italy. I see another one who died in the Solomon Islands, another one from Italy, Guam. Um, and then, oh, wow, Lawrence Grant. Look at that who died at Pearl Harbor, 1941, and was on the USS Arizona. Wow. Well, those six men are depicted here on this mural going off to war. Yeah, that is really something. All right, I mentioned how there was a county museum here in town that I wanted to check out because county museums can have some really, really interesting stuff if you take the time to go check them out. Uh, the county museum here is in this stone building, but unfortunately, I took a little bit too long just exploring and looking at things today, and they're closed. So anyway, we're, we're staying in town here tonight, so uh, we're gonna come back tomorrow and check this place out before we get on down the road to Springfield. All right, uh, I think we're gonna go ahead and go back to uh, the Wagon Wheel Motel now and uh, check out our room. All right, we've made our way back over to the Wagon Wheel and this is a, a really interesting place. It started in 1935 and if you'll notice, there's some gas pumps here. Uh, which you might be wondering why are gas pumps at a motel well this was what was called a full service tourist court so there was a restaurant here and there was uh the, the filling station there was also an auto garage and then the the motel in the back you may have already noticed this old chevrolet that is here on the property uh, and this is here you can see uh, where the sign says standard oil products uh, at the garage portion of the tourist court. So if you needed an oil change or if your car broke down or something like that, well, you can see down below where servicemen could get down there and work on your vehicle. Uh, and then over here, well, you would have like the main part of the tourist court. Uh, there would have been a restaurant inside there. And then I just love these old gas pumps. Uh, some of you watching might be old enough to remember when you would come up to these old filling stations where you could get regular uh, unleaded gasoline or get leaded gasoline. Of course, that's something that you don't see anymore. But man, being here, really kind of takes you back. Uh, this, this whole tourist court was started in 1935 and, and being here you can kind of get a little taste of what it must have been like for the people who were traveling right along this road during that time. When you come behind the office, well this is where we find the lodging portion of the facility here. Uh, all of the facilities here 
were again built in the 1930s, uh, built from like Ozark stone, which still is you know the way it is today. Uh, so they've done a really good job at preserving this place. Uh, the doors are original. The the wood floors inside are original. So so it's really neat how how they've preserved the the history here. And I was talking to the owner inside, and we were talking about European tourists who come over to the United States and travel Route 66. And she said that one night uh, they had 11 rooms that were filled with people from 10 different countries here, and they were all out here uh, by this fire pit. Uh, one evening chatting and talking. So we have got ourselves a room uh, right here in the middle in room number five. So we're gonna go in and check it out. All right, we just got into the room where we are going to be staying this evening. And the, the room is small which is typical for a lot of these older hotels from the you know 1930s and 40s and things like that. Uh, but I, I like the kind of classic throwback feel that it has. So we've got these hardwood floors and then well, here is the rest of the, the room. Uh, I went ahead and went with the, the queen size bed for this evening. All right, well, uh, as far as miles go, we didn't really get too far today, but that's kind of what Route 66 is about, is slowing down and taking your time and, and seeing things. I uh, got kind of sidetracked on a, on a few little side trips today. Uh, but anyway, this, like I said, pretty cool room, kind of neat to, to be in the, the longest uh, continuously running hotel on Route 66. Uh, we're gonna get a little bit of work done this evening and then tomorrow, go check out this museum and get back on the road.